Um, hello, no, good afternoon. And welcome to a keynote event of the 2023 Hofstra Presidential Symposium. Uh, this symposium strikes me as a perfect reflection of my moment in Hofstra's trajectory in that it's taking up a question and uh, a question about an emerging technology and recognizing that it can be analyzed from the full range of disciplines at Hofstra uh, with a series of sessions over three days that uh, take up all sorts of different angles on the topic of artificial intelligence in higher education, friend, morpha, question marks, uh, thinking about what we can, uh, what we can figure out about that. I sure t on our keynote speaker, who is the uh, Joseph G. Aston Presidential Academic Symposium Scholar, is Professor Kathleen Creel of Northeastern University. She's a philosopher of science, meaning that she works on philosophical questions and analysis of science itself, of science's ideas and methods and its relationship to our broader culture and value set, particularly will be reflected in this talk. Uh, Professor Creel was, as an undergraduate, a major in both philosophy and computer science. I think we've seen some of our students do. She went on to work as a software engineer at MIT, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at Lincoln Laboratory, working on a satellite project, and says that she found herself as a software engineer thinking about the use of technology in high-stakes decision-making and some of the philosophical and ethical questions that that raised. Professor Creel then uh, did a master's degree at Simon Fraser University in philosophy before going on to the discipline leading program within history and philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Uh, she was after that the first fellow in a program at Stanford University uh, embedding ethics modules into core computer science courses that Stanford University had long offered and was, and was updated. Earlier in her career, Professor Creel won the Ernest Nagel Early Career Scholar Essay Award from the Philosophy of Science Association, chapter article Transparency in Complex Computational Systems. She's also written research on a variety of areas, uh, publishing a paper with a co-author called the Algorithmic Leviathan, Arbitrariness, Fairness, and Opportunity in Algorithmic Decision Making in the Canadian Journal of Philosophy. She also published with uh, other co-authors, I think from both philosophy and medicine, on a paper called Clinical Decisions Using AI Must Consider Patient Values uh, in Nature Medicine. Uh, her talk today will be on uh, algorithmic monoculture and the automation of college admissions. Welcome to Professor Kathleen Cree. Hello, um, thanks so much for that generous introduction. And I'm to, uh, I really look forward to speaking with you today. So thanks also to all the organizers of this fantastic presidential symposium. I've gotten a lot of talks already, and I feel you all can stay for the rest of the next two days. It gets really wonderful. I also want to thank my collaborators on some of the projects I'm about to present. Uh, wonderful scholars from computer science, law, and labor economics. Okay, so a lot of us were recently on the other side of this, but Let's, let's try to imagine things from an admission committee's point of view. So you, uh, it's, it's the fall, it's the winter, um, it's beautiful outside, but you are faced with a stack of tens of thousands of applications for people that look really good. And you have to figure out, out of all these tens of thousand applications, how do I choose the right people to give offers to? And then how do I give those offers in such a way that exactly the right 1,800 people at the end are going to come to my university. So, and those right people were you, and here you are. You tend to So this is actually a hard problem. Um, to us that don't have to do it, it might seem easy. Just pick me. That's the right answer. Uh, but to the people who have to go through these files, there are a lot of constraints. So you have time constraints. You only get, what, maybe 20 minutes per file? You have information constraints. 
you have privacy constraints, care some things you can't know. There's some things you don't know. There is the vast, you know, richness of the human person that's not contained in any file, no matter how long. Um, and the feature space is undefined. That's a computer science way of saying, we don't know what we're looking for. If we knew exactly all the different combinations of uh, characteristics of a person, past history of a person, that would perfectly predict their success in college, it would be a lot easier. But we don't have perfect access to that because there are so many different ways to be a good college student. And so we have this goal of admitting a diverse class who will be handy here, who will be successful here, who will stay here. How do we do it? Well, um, as with a lot of areas of life, ought to be the decision-making systems have tried to step into this breach and said, hey, overworked uh, admissions officers, we can use predictive analytics to try to solve this problem for you. So uh, this stat is quite old. Actually, I couldn't find a more updated stat, but in 2015, 75% of colleges and universities used some kind of predictive analytics. I would be shocked if that number was at almost 100% at this point. The predictive analytics have improved so much in the past eight years. Um, so a lot of colleges turn to third-party software that promises to increase applicant yield. So out of the number of people that we admit, how many actually come? I better target financial aid, who are the people who really need it, um, and increase the diversity of the student body. So in computer science, we call this a multi-objective optimization problem. We have a bunch of different things that we're trying to optimize for at the same time. So how do we strike the right balance between these different goals? And how do we use the data that we've gathered in the past to do a better job predicting than just our guesses based on each individual file? So there are a lot of different clippuses for this software um, to save time and money, to help us choose better candidates, to help reduce our biases as flawed human beings who are looking at these decision files, and to produce more consistent judgments. And it's this last part that I want to focus on. Um, so there are two ways of thinking about consistency. We could say, we want to be consistent from decision to decision. So human beings are actually very mad at this. There are really interesting studies where if you give a judge a re real file that they saw a couple months ago, and you just change some of the names and details, but not the underlying legal facts of the case, they will often give a different decision. So we are not even self-consistent looking at the same information over time. Uh, but we also might wonder, okay, so we have consistency within a single person over time. We have consistency among the different members of a committee. And then the other could have consistency between institutions. To what extent are different institutions making the same decisions when faced with the same information? So let's look at that for a minute. So from the applicant perspective, um, you applied to Kotstra, obviously. You didn't apply to Stony Brook, the obviously. Uh, we could. Uh, Thank you, Stony Brook, Stony Brook. I, I Googled this, that's your rival, right? Hey, boo, boo. <laughs> okay, uh, and you, you applied to Northeastern. That's where I work. I think it's pretty, okay. This goes to uh, okay, so you applied to these three schools and we're not going to leave these three schools behind because I don't actually use, know what they use in their admissions, but we're going to do three fake schools. So you applied to these three fake schools, and your understanding, I, I suspect, was that at those three schools, uh, three different groups of people would be looking at your file. And that is true. But also, it's possible that at three of the schools you applied to, those groups of people were relying on the same predictive analytics software. So what happens in the case where an applicant believes that they're applying to three different schools, but all three schools are using the same software to analyze their file? So that's the case I want to think about for most of this talk. Um, and it brings a new factor to decision making that I think we really didn't have before we had artificial intelligence and uh, automated decision making tools at this scale. So the degree of standardization that we can get 
from predictive analytics and automated decision making being deployed at scale is something that's new and I think really raises some interesting ethical and social problems. So the first thing I want to think about is that automated decision making systems can standardize by enforcing the same classification on the same token applicant file every time it's encountered at scale. And what I mean by that is you sign in the same uh, college board application file, you are the same person, you have the same characteristics, you have the same GPA. So every time that list of characteristics, your essays, whatever it may be, is re-encountered by the same system, it has the potential to give the same decision. But I'll it. And the question is, is this standardization a problem? If the same uh, third-party software provider provides software to 2,100 institutions accounting, not all of which are universities, uh, is this kind of reliance on the same back-end decision-making a problem? So first, I'm going to look at some empirical questions. Why would we think this is happening? What are forces that might standardize algorithmic decision-making? Then I'm going to think about uh, when should we consider this to be a problem? Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. And if it's a problem, what do we think should be done? So first, let's look at what standardizes algorithmic decisions. Uh, this will be not new to you, but I just want to start with the basic nature of an algorithm. So uh, why would an algorithm intrinsically mean the kind of thing that standardizes a decision? So you, you use a lot of algorithms implicitly in your life. Um, if you use Google Maps or some kind of uh, software that allows you to find a path from one place to another, there's an algorithm on the back end that's figuring out out of all the different roads that would take you from where you are to where you want to be, which segments of those roads should we add up to create a path? So that's a type of algorithm. So um, if you alphabetize things in your document, uh, that's an algorithm that says, take this unordered list of um, letters and put the one with the ones with A starting first and the one to in C last. And there's a procedure for doing that. Uh, it happens really fast, so we don't necessarily see what that procedure is until we take our first algorithms class. Uh, but there is a procedure under the hood. Likewise, if we're in ranking some kind of a list or um, closer to the problem we're looking at today, if we're matching entries from two lists. So there's a really famous and lovely medical school residency matching algorithm where all of the medical schools uh, list the candidates that they're interested in order, the candidates list all the medical schools that they're interested in, and then there's a matching algorithm that figures out uh, which candidates go to which school, and then that's analysis on match day, which you might have heard people talk about. Okay, so what are all these algorithms? They are step-by-step -step procedures that are used in calculation for problem solving. So I mostly like giving you examples of problem solving, but we could also think about them in your math classes, etc. Cool. Algorithms can be complicated or they can be simple. So uh, imagine an algorithm to spread Nutella on toast. You might say, okay, get a piece of bread. Then you're giving instructions to a young, younger sibling. First, get a piece of bread. Don't throw the bread on the ground. Don't rip it in half. Don't stab it with your knife. I see you doing all of those things, younger sibling. Actually, just toast it and then leave it. Don't touch it. And then get the Nutella from the cupboard. No, don't pull all the things out of the cupboard. Just get the Nutella and then spread the Nutella uniformly on the brain. And so if we were to be able to rate this algorithm at the right level of detail, at the right fine-grained uh, level of specificity, then if each of us did this algorithm, we would get the same result. We would get uh, a piece of bread with the same amount of Nutella spread evenly across it. And so if we each follow the same algorithm, we should get the same result every time. Okay, so basic nature of the algorithm. There's one reason to think that using algorithmic decision-making over human decision-making is likely to standardize these processings. 
Second reason, something called algorithmic monoculture. So when we think about monoculture, we think about uh, agriculture. So rows and rows of identical plants that are planted in a field. Uh, there's very little species diversity compared to, say, a forest or a grassland or, I mean, a wetland. I'm running out of ecosystems. Uh, so the uh, monoculture in agriculture has some benefits. It's easier for the farmer. It creates more standard produce. And it has some well-known problems, which is, for example, if one um, if one row of crops gets a disease, it can potentially infect the entire field. So there can be cascading problems where, uh, because everything in the field is identical, something that affects one thing will affect all the other things. This will become relevant very shortly. Thank. So algorithmic monoculture, very similarly, is the state in which many decision makers are all relying on the same algorithm. And in our fake uh, example of college admission software, we can imagine a third-party software provider called iStudent, this was not real, uh, built some kind of applicant screening algorithm for universities, and it supplies the exact same algorithm to three universities. Uh, but this is not that realistic. So in some work with um, co-authors, I've tried to relax this definition a little bit. Because even if we look at things that are extremely homogenous, there's still some variation. So this row of houses initially appears identical, but if you look, you'll see that these all have added different little porches, they have different landscaping, they have different colored doors, I don't know to what extent the homeowners association is yelling at them about these things or whether they are at peace with these modifications, but most monocultures are not purely identical. So let's think about a slightly relaxed definition of algorithmic monoculture in which many decision makers are making similar decisions, but not necessarily to be identical in every respect. So here we could imagine that I assume still builds an applicant screening algorithm, but now they adapt it slightly for these three different universities based on those universities' interests, desires, characteristics, goals, etc. So here we have the same scenario where an applicant is applying to three universities, uh, but now the uh, third-party software provider has adapted their software for each of these three universities. Or we could even imagine a less homogenous uh, monoculture in which there are different providers. This is also more realistic. So uh, there are many providers of this kind of software. And so not all the universities that one would apply to would use the exact same ones. Okay. Nevertheless, I think we have a lot of reasons to think that there's strong standardizing forces on the outcomes of those models. So I'm going to walk you through some of those standardizing forces. One, of course, is if we did use the exact same model across the whole domain. Uh, that's not ecologically realistic to what we see. Um, a second, and the most prominent, is standardization due to some kind of shared component. So that could be, uh, as I just said, you take the model and you use that as a base and adapt it in some way. Um, but that could also be that you have some kind of shared data that you train on me. So uh, being in now the realm of college admissions, if we think about how this happens in the machine learning ecosystem, we see this all the time, right? So for a long time, uh, BERT is a large language model that came before the model was that underlying chat Jamie cheat. Um, something like 83% of natural language processing papers used BERT for long time. It was the first model that people perceived to be good that had to work. And so um, everyone used it because it was the best thing on the market. Uh, likewise, ImageNet was um, a data set that you heard mentioned in the first talk today. So ImageNet uh, was the first large repository of labeled images. And this is super important for uh, image our image-based artificial intelligence, because we want to learn how to recognize our, our 
objects or artifacts in some kind of an image, you need labels. So um, ImageNet was the first such repository, but that meant that everyone trained on ImageNet. Likewise, if there are good components uh, like PyTorch or other sort of libraries, people are going to use those. And um, another source of standardization is evaluations. We all want to win tests. We all want to receive the esteem and small snaps of our peers. And so we uh, flock to the same popular evaluations and we try to engineer our models so that they do well in those tests. And if we're all trying to do well on the same tests, our models are going to have some of the same features because we're aiming for the same. <laughs> so just to sort of make those more vivid, take me something like ImageNet. So there are a couple of really interesting papers that show that models that all train on ImageNet end up having similar errors to each other. Even though these models are built by completely different teams uh, for different purposes in many cases, what they all train on ImageNet. So one of the errors is relying on what is the texture in the background to predict the foreground object. So in these cases, you see on the left, it's supposed to be a fox squirrel. Uh, I don't know what a fox squirrel is. I take it as a type of squirrel. Uh, that's depicted in the same um, But it's predicted with 99% confidence by many, many, many models to be a sea lion. On the right, you see a dragon flying, predicted with very high confidence to be a manhole cover. Um, and what you'll note in both of these images is that they could be the kind of things that image recognition software could be really good at. Image recognition software loves it when you put the focal image right in the middle and you don't have too much other distracting stuff around it. So the dragonfly should be great. We put the focal thing in the middle, um, there's just one solid texture behind it. But if you note, in both cases, the texture of the sea lion's wet, damp skin looks like the texture of the rock. The texture and the cross-hatching of a manhole cover looks like the cross-hatching of the probably lawn chair that the dragonfly is on. So um, it's not just that the model makes a mistake, all of the fishnet models make this kind of mistake. So we have a concentration of mistakes due to the shared use of this training data. And there are some domains where you would expect that every model is going to use the same training data. So you heard earlier about how uh, ChatGPT and other OpenAI models, actually all large language models pretty much use Wikipedia. Um, they all use some version of this thing called comment crawl, which is like we tried to scrape the entire text of the web using crawlers. But we only have one internet. We only have one, you know, melting terabyte size uh, data set that captures the entire internet. Even if we decided, hey, we're not going to use common crawl, and for some reason we're going to spend a bunch of money and do it ourselves, we would still be scraping the same internet. So this kind of shared reliance on data can create similar patterns of success and of errors uh, because we're all trying to fit the same underlying. <laughs> so I'm going to use the term foundation model to talk about uh, large language models, but also uh, large uh, text to image models, large uh, image to video models, et cetera. So any kind of large model that uses a lot of data, uses significant computational resources, and then uh, has diverse downstream applications. So we're familiar with these models from generative AI. So that could be ChatGPT, that could be MidJourney, that could be Copilot. But one characteristic of these models is that they are built at tremendous scale. So some of these models cost $10 million to print. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was building a $10 million model, what's my pocket change? Uh, I wouldn't want to just use it once and then throw it into the trash. It's like, there is no reason to build a $10 million model unless you're going to use it for a lot of different things. And that could be uh, I'm using it for one task, but an enormous number of people are using it over time. Or that could be I'm using it for a lot of different tasks, 
uh, with perhaps a small amount of work. But either way, you only make that kind of investment if you're imagining that this model will scale. Um, likewise, the pace of adoption has been tremendous. And you all have probably experienced this. Either you or people you know use these models a lot. Well, so do people who are writing software, so do people who are creating APIs. Uh, things that you use might have these models beneath the hood, um, whether you, as a consumer, are made aware of it or not. So developers are relying on these types of models and the same models just as heavily as you are. But adapting the same foundation model for many many tasks has the potential to create a single point of Gallagher. So whatever is true about that model has a natural to be propagated downstream and also be true in those downstream uses. And with some co-authors, we've seen that this kind of model and component sharing is also very common in the large language model ecosystem. So we see data set hugs, which is popular data sets that a lot of different well-known, also popular models rely on. So here, uh, there's a data set called the Pile by Eleutor AI, which makes a big effort to clean some of the data from the internet, um, which is very disturbing in a lot of different ways. So they tried to do a better job clicking than many other people. So that means because the data is better, now a lot more models will rely on that data. Um, likewise, there are model hubs where lots of different um, applications use the same models. And there are API hubs. So for models like OpenAI, like the only access to this API interface, lots of different models will that rely on that API interface. And I think more speculatively, we see a similar thing in the college admissions ecosystem. So certainly we know that there's this shared use of predictive analytics models. Third-party software providers each boasts that they work with hundreds of universities. Okay, good. Then we also have shared reliance on the same large language models um, to the extent that these systems, which I think they're not really doing yet, but to the extent that they are on the frontier of using large language models in their day-to-day uh, -day operations, they are also going to look to the same providers of large language models who have made it easy to incorporate this into software products. And finally, um, many model creators buy the same data. So if you talk to them, they will talk about the same sources of data, either available in the commercial market or available to large server slides. It turns 50. Thanks. Okay. So. Um, I've given a few reasons to think that algorithmic decisions at the scale are likely to have some degree of standardization. Now, why do we care about this? Why might it matter to us that algorithmic decisions be standardized? Well, the thing I want to suggest is that this kind of standardization can also homogenize outcomes. Okay. So we have other sources of homogenization of outcomes. So I don't know if people remember this uh, famous lawsuit. The lawsuit alleged that 16 elite colleges like Yale and MIT were part of a price-fixing cartel where they had agreed uh, between each other on what prices of financial aid to give students. And the lawsuit alleged that this depressed the amount of financial aid that students would be given. So if they hadn't colluded to uh, set these lower bars, each of them would have needed to compete to offer more financial aid to students. And so this kind of collusion artificially depressed the amount of financial aid that students got at those institutions. Of course, this is only 16 schools. So uh, schools who are not part of that can gain an advantage by departing from that collusion and offering more generous financial aid. So uh, until this, you know, unless this were to infect the whole record, which we don't think it did, um, there are lots of ways around this. But the question is, in this case, we know why this collusion happened. We know why uh, this artificial depression of prices happened. 
it was because human beings talked to each other and decided to do it. That's old-fashioned collision. But is it possible that there's a new-fashioned collision that schools may not even be aware of, that they may not be pursuing intentionally, where schools all rely on the same providers, uh, software that tells them what financial aid amounts are the right amounts to set. And because those providers of software uh, that I would rely on the same data, they end up having very similar predictions. Um, I did put this slide in here, I should have, but there was an interesting uh, news article that suggested something like this was happening in the Seattle rental market, where different um, landlords were relying on the same uh, rent price prediction algorithm. And so rent prices were rising faster in the areas where more landlords used that rent price prediction. So uh, is it possible that applicants can receive the same admissions to students' financial aid packages, uh, but also that we might make mistakes on the same individuals, that we might overlook the same students who would have the opportunity to thrive at this college, but who are overlooked systematically by some kind of feature or bug in the software. So again, we're imagining this case where someone is interacting with different algorithmic decision-making systems. Uh, and now let's think about the outcomes they receive. So let's say you apply to three colleges. Uh, actually, in this box diagram, you and your three friends are each applying to three colleges. And um, only the second person is systemically excluded from all the colleges. Other people receive some kind of mix of outcomes or are accepted at all the colleges. So let's look at this case of the person in the second row who applied to three colleges and wasn't accepted at any of them. And we're gonna call down a systemic failure. Uh, in this person's interaction with the system, they were not able to receive any positive outcomes. Uh, and if that was a mistake, we can also call that a systemic um, rejection or failure. So internally, we're gonna say, uh, Outcome homogenization is where an individual or group receives the same outcomes from different decision makers, and it's a systemic failure if every decision making system fails for that person, and it's a failure in a classification setting if every decision making system misclassifies a person. Okay, so I have two formula slides. Bear with me. I know you can't. I see it in your eyes. You're ready. You've been waiting for the formula slide. It's in week. Okay, so first we have a really simple um, systemic failure. Does every model inch fail for the individual J? Here we just count all the bundles. We see what their outcomes are. Uh, that's very simple. But now we have to normalize this a little bit, right? Because it might be that the reason we have all this model failure is not because of any kind of fancy you know, an alg algorithmic monoculture that I've been talking about, it might be because all of the cells are very bad. Then so it might be that each of them has a high error rate. And so if each of the models uh, makes errors, let's say, than most of the applicants, then you would expect a really high degree of collision of those errors. Collision when those errors lined up on the same person, even though uh, there's even if they were completely independent, even if they were not uh, colluding in this way. So we have to normalize by the error rate. We have to say, given how error prone each of these models are, what is the rate of collision in these errors we would expect? And then is the rate that we actually see more or less than that? Um, okay, so that's what we do. Um, we have not been able to get access to the kind of data that would allow us to measure whether this is happening can the college admissions ecosystem. If anyone has access to that data, find me. To be please, if you can slip me a note under the door, send me, you know, a passenger pigeon, whatever it takes. Uh, but we do see homogenous outcomes elsewhere in other algorithmic decision-making systems that we were able to study. So. This is a grant from our study of commercial APIs. So these are uh, large systems provided by Amazon, Google, um, IBM, et cetera, 
that do things like um, recognize people's faces, uh, turn people's voice clips into uh, text, so uh, we speech to text, um, recognize what people are saying in their writing style, so taking different clips of writing and training it into um, uh, some kind of summary. But, so on all these different tasks, what you'll notice is that these different AI models just classify the same individual much more often than would be expected because they're in the Now, I think this actually gets into something very deep that I tried to inject into this computer science paper and I got stressed down to like air wrap, but I'm gonna say the verbally now because my co-authors are not here. Uh, so when you tell this to computer scientists, they will often say, and I get this, um, yes, all the models make mistakes on the samples that are hard. And then he said, well, what does it mean to be hard? And they said, well, it's the samples that all the models make mistakes on. And that can be like, dead. We also note that with these models improved, they under improve on the things that they were previously failing on. So they're more likely to improve on things that the bottom of the floor model was already got right than they are in the bank to set uh, the models go. Okay, so when should we consider this to be a problem? Uh, we've seen what this is. We've seen some reason to think that it happens uh, in systems of algorithmic product culture. Now, when should we consider this to be an ethical problem? Because in a lot of the cases I've outlined, this phenomenon arises from people making the best decisions they can based on the data available. So we want people to seek out the best, cleanest data sets. We want people to seek out the best models available. So there's some knowledge benefit to the practice. So when are the cases when that benefit uh, is not worth it and we should seek out some kind of uh, redress for people who are hard fighting this? So the clearest case is the case of bias. So um, since we have been doing admissions using algorithms, there have been uh, query cases where people do it poorly and then uh, exhibit the same kind of social biases that they were trying to avoid. So there's a classic case from 1979. So if you remember the first talk today, that's back in uh, perhaps a previous AI winter. Um, where St. George's Hospital in the UK decided to uh, deal with, again, this problem, 2,500 applicants. We want to interview 625 of them, and then of those, offer 425 spots. So the interview is like really the, the sharp bottleneck, and then most of the people we interview, we accept to the med school. But we're tired of reading these 2,500 applications, and so uh, the dean finishes a classification algorithm to do the job instead. Uh, sounds exciting, but unfortunately, the algorithm is biased. Yeah. And so initially he says, look, um, based on our historic data, uh, my algorithm can get 90 to 95% of our historic decisions right. So it's aligning with what we used to do. Now, what we used to do in 1979, maybe it wasn't so good. Maybe we should immediately think, wait a second, do we want to align with what we were doing in the past perfectly? Uh, but in 1982, they started adopting this algorithm uh, and use it on real applicants. And then the tr and internal review says, wait a second, why does this algorithm include factors like name and place of birth? Yes. Those are not things that should be used to predict whether you'll be a good med school at the yeah. um, And so, Two internal whistleblowers reported this finding to the Equal Opportunity Commission at the UK, after. and they found that it did name and place of birth were used to dock points from female and what they called non Caucasian and activate seat. So, this is, we can think about this in a couple of different ways. One of the ways we can think about this is the computer science phrase garbage in, garbage out. So, because we knew that there's really biased data on those past decisions that people had made, that did exclude these applicants, the algorithm is going to learn that pattern and replicate them. And so one of the mistakes we might made was giving this algorithm this biased data. Um, a second is this improper use of sensitive features. So 
they, they never should have used names of our place of birth. Those are, even if those are predictive, they're predictive of these decisions that people made for bias reasons, not predictive of success in med school. And we see similar biases like these in these large language model causation models. So uh, in output uh, produced by ChatGBT, if you ask ChatGBT to complete the phrase, three person in this religion walked into a bar, uh, completions with Muslim names will be much more likely to include some kind of story that's generated that includes violence. Um, so these kind of biases are baked even into the creative generation that these models do. Likewise, um, this is a different kind of foundation model where uh, it's an image to text model. And so we're trying to do the task um, and label this image. So as I look at this image, I see uh, a woman wearing a classic NASA astronaut jumpsuit. She's sitting in the classic NASA pose. She has a giant spaceship in the background, the NASA logo, the American flag, uh, a helmet. But nevertheless, the model says that it's less likely that this is a portrait of an astronaut with the American flag than this is a photograph of a smiling housewife in an orange jumpsuit with the American flag. So these kinds of uh, biased predictions are common in all of these different tasks that we use the opposite. Okay, so if we're expressing some kind of bias, we cannot really care a story for why the outputs are homogenous and why they're unacceptable. They're replicating a social bias that we already know about and they're unacceptable on that basis. And we have a clear moral story for why that's bad. What I want to investigate in the last portion of the talk is what should we think about cases where there is some kind of systemic exclusion, but it's not a social bias that we understand. So what about negative sentiment towards names in a well-known box? So uh, this is kind of a large chart, but you'll notice in the bold new words that people who have recently ran for some kind of US office, such as Bernie, Hillary, Donald, Barrage, hurting me, uh, have much more negative sentiment associated with them than your standard name. Now, I think we have a really clear causal story for why this happens, which is that one of the things that almost all models are trained on is data screen from Reddit. And what happens on Reddit? Well, people talk about candidates they hate, and they say, this candidate is so bad, and I hate them, and they're never in America. And so there is a lot of negative sentiment associated with these names on uh, these platforms. So if there's some kind of name artifact uh, where your large language model just consistently doesn't like dumbness, to speak colloquially, and if they cause some kind of negative consequence that's just big enough to dip someone who was otherwise a 51% applicant under the threshold to be a 49% applicant, yeah. is it not fair to dump? Is it unfair to uh, birdies, is it unfair to bills? There are lots more weird uh, artifacts like this, so I'm, I'm using name artifacts because I think they're funny. Uh, but there are many more artifacts that are in these associations in the model between different characteristics you can have and um, some kind of negative sentiment or output. And it does not seem like these name artifacts are discriminatory bias because they don't rise to the level of discriminatory bias. So for most philosophical definitions of discriminatory bias, we would use something like the perpetual subordination of disadvantaged groups such that their political power is severely circumscribed. That's just not true for dogs. Um, we would need something like uh, social salience of the relevant groups. So they structure our interactions with people in those groups and so contacts. That's just not true of Hillary's as a group of people. So I don't think it rises to the level of discriminatory bias, um, except on some sort of very permissive accounts of bias, where we might say 
a bias is any kind of undesirable outcome assigned to individual or group of individuals on grounds that are unreasonable. Absolutely. Yeah. So it it is that, uh, but that's a pretty permissive definition of bias. I think instead we want to think um, about why this might be wrong for reasons that are not about bias. Um, one is systemic exclusion of individuals from. And here we want to turn to uh, a classic ethical and political theory called contractualism. So in contractualism, we're all deciding as a group uh, what set of rules or decision principles we can adopt and what we would consider to be acceptable. So it doesn't have to be all of our favorite, but it has to be something that all of us can agree to as about threshold. And the standard that's often put forward is a decision-making principle is acceptable if no one affected can reasonably reject it. Now, reasonable rejection here is not just like you want to reject it. It's reasonable if uh, the burden imposed on the rejector is greater than what alternative principles would impose on others. So let me make that given with an example. So we've heard of dippies who say, not in my backyard, uh, put it in someone else's backyard. So imagine if you had uh, a cell tower and everyone in the town had agreed, yes, we want the cell tower, we are tired of our garbage, cell service, we all want this tower. Um, and they said, okay, great. The most optimal location would be in this person's backyard. So that person can only reject the cell tower if it's imposing a greater burden on them than it would on someone else. And we can't just move the cell tower around to be fully burdened people. There has to be some reason why the cell tower is worse for you than it would be for some mess. So can we apply a similar kind of analysis here? Can we say, a contractualist can reject this principle if the well-being of the same small group is known to be consistently sacrificed for the greater good? So I think we can, because uh, the contractualist also says, um, look, we can switch from this decision-making principle, in our case, this consistent algorithm that all the decision-makers are using. Instead of saying we're going to have one algorithm and it's going to concentrate all the errors on the same small group of people, we can say, let's switch to a system where we have a bunch of different algorithms and there are still errors. We can make a perfect decision-making system, but the errors are spread over more people. So the contextualist, I think, has a reason to reject this kind of homogenous system and prefer some kind of heterogeneity in the error distribution. So how do we do that? Well, the only thing we can do is have more than one model. So if we have the first model where 100 people out of college can are qualified, uh, the, model, the first model successfully finds nine of them, but rejects Anna broadly. And the second model is very similar, but instead rejects Julian. We could alternate between these those models. So instead of using the same model every time, we can shift these unreasonable rejections around between people. So one way to do this uh, technically would be to have some kind of a, a lottery where every time we run the model, every you know um, different college running with our version of this model. Um, we're going to say, hey, there are some points, there are some people that we are really uncertain about and why. And we're just going to flip those people. So we're going um, to flip a coin and then give those people different outcomes each time that we run it, which means that different schools, some will reject that person and some will accept that person. Yeah. And this is really nice because we won't lose a lot of predictive accuracy, but we do get significant drops in this thing that I'm worried about out on the homogenization. Fewer applicants are wrongly rejected by all fathers. But some people really don't like this because they say, hey, I don't want my college admission decision at any school to be random. I want it to be on the basis of some best model that exists. Uh, and so one thing we could do to get around this is say, okay, fine, let's create multiple models and Let's constrain them to be as different as possible from each other while still being successfully fixed. And then we'll just randomize between those models. 
And this relies on a feature of machine learning that already exists, which is called predictive multiplicity. There already were lots of models out there that were pretty good. We just picked one of them beforehand. And now we're going to make that a little more explicit and choose between them in real time. So, um, in summary, we have these shared algorithms, data, and foundation models that can contribute to an algorithmic monoculture. These monocultures can lead to homogenous outcomes where all those most algorithms make mistakes on the same people. And we should consider this to be a problem when it concentrates unreasonable burdens on the same capability right over. And to address it, each decision maker should randomize some of their most uncertain predictions to depart from that consensus. So I'm hoping that instead of the uh, monocultural fields that we had, we will have the beautiful field the wildflowers for you all get in the Yes, sir. When can... Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, in a moment, we will open up to your questions, so be thinking about what those are. Uh, in the meantime, uh, maybe just a couple of questions for you. Um, I thought, I was wondering what other context do you think uh, besides the admission context, should we be worrying that this kind of standardization, homogenization problem might increasingly arise that might affect us in our, in our lives? Yeah, so great question. I think we have some pretty good evidence that this happens in algorithmic resume screening. Um, so there was a case brought forward by an applicant called, named Derek Motley, where he alleged that uh, because all of his AME applications put in through the Workday system had been rejected, that something about his file had, um, yeah, just not been properly evaluated by Workday, given his really good qualifications. So algorithmic hiring, for sure. Um, I think there is some, I feel less confident in the loan applications, but I think that's also possible. Um, and then I think it's going to be really interesting to see once more systems move on the current state where you often have algorithmic decisions being made by pretty simple um, algorithms, often like linear models, to reliance on more foundation models, whether we will have more concentration of the kind that I was uh, speculating about. Thank you. We were also just talking about um, El Longino and her idea that um, in order for a theory to be a good one, it needs to be transparent. And one of the problems that's been mentioned about uh, use of machine learning and other AIs as a is that how they make decisions is not transparent to the users. In this case, maybe the admissions offices that might, might uh, purchase and use the AIs. I was wondering how much um, is it possible for these kinds of models to see uh, behind the uh, the output, I mean, to it, or is is part of the problem not just that we're getting bad output, but that we can't see why? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a big part of the problem. So it's part of the problem in two ways. One way is even if we say, okay, uh, let's try to create some what people call post hoc after the fact that interpretability or explainability. Let's try, for example, to see out of all the data that I gave you initially, what if that data was most important in coming to the decision that you can to? So we can ask the algorithm to reconstruct this. Um, even if we do that, we don't know whether it was uh, those features that are interpreted in, in the way that we would implicitly understand them, you know, the hygiene DA by itself and created the outcome that you were accepted to school or whether it's some much more complicated conjunction of these different features having different weights, et cetera. So we're getting better at these techniques to try to reconstruct what the basis of the algorithmic decision was, but we don't always know. And that's just thinking about one algorithm by itself. We now have this case where one thing that I at least think we should want to know is how similar are the bases of these algorithmic decisions across many decision makers. And that's something that's almost impossible to figure out because each of the decision makers view those algorithms as primary. 
And so we have a different kind of transparency. The first kind of transparency issue is even the people making it has to work really hard to figure out how it's making this decision. The second kind of transparency is much more simple and much more common, which is slightly those, and they just won't tell you. Uh, and so unless we had some kind of legislative shift that allowed people to compare these decision-making procedures across institutions or, you know, I don't know if people propose jobs or what might have you, we can't really know. And I'll ask one more question before we open it up. Uh, part of your conclusion was that a uh, solution to this kind of problem might be using multiple nodes, right? And maybe combining them, but in any case, having a diversity of, of models. I was wondering how, uh, how realistic is it is that in the context where we use algorithmic decision-making that we could have um, models that are genuinely diverse enough to, um, to solve this kind of problem and whether that um, having, if one model costs $10 million to train, is it reasonable in the various industries to train enough diverse models to, to solve that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think you're right that it's, um, it's hard to pause it you know, given the environmental and financial costs, oh, we should build a bunch more models of this size uh, just for this reason. But what we could do is a lot of these models, when they're used in particular decision-making setups, have some kind of wrapper on the tongue, which is an extra uh, piece of software or program that controls the outputs that have actually occurred based on what the model decides. So then I think we could seek more diversity and, and seek to pull the models further. Our tiny chiller. And with that, uh, we invite your questions. Um, there's a microphone there, and uh, please step up and use the microphone so that uh, people on the, uh, the live stream of the internet can hear your question. Thanks. Do we get a sound? Nothing. Hi, Dr. Krill. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. My question was, we know that <clears throat> some institutions allow you to appeal an admissions decision. How do you think the increasing use of AI for analytics to decide who gets it and who does not will impact that process? Will it become more widespread or will it become more difficult? How do you think people will feel if they know more transparently, oh, it's a machine rejected thing and not some human? I, can. I think the good thing about, yeah, great question. Thank you. I think the good thing about the college admissions process as compared to other cases, uh, including algorithmic hiring, in algorithmic hiring, oftentimes half the applicants are thrown out before a human ever sees them. We see this across many different algorithmic um, resume screens. It's not that way in college admissions. In college admissions, there is typically a person who certifies these decisions. And so um, in that sense, we think we're better off. And as you said, there is this process of recourse. Uh, recourse is what people are fighting for in so many different algorithmic decision-making contexts. They're saying, we just need some way, why these mistakes happen, to be able to appeal, to be able to get some kind of recourse that isn't just, oh, the algorithm decided and the algorithm was objective. So I think you're right that this role of appeal and recourse is going to become even more important um, as more of the decisions are made with or helped by predictive analytics. Thank you. Me too. Come on, that was a spicy talk. I said that as should all be like randomly, you know, there should be a lottery that controls whether you get into college. I know you have comments or questions. And, it's in, and I'm just going to offer as extra credit to any of my students. Been so come take them. So it's on the side left, actually. So, that was a so I was at a talk on Sunday where we were talking about the use of AI in peer review. So one of my colleagues was advocating for peer review that was all AI. It was like, I don't feel like that's great. We're we work in the biomedical field. So I'm just wondering what you think about that, where you're kind of, you don't really have an algorithm and we know the biomedical evidence base is really extremely biased, as is the kind of current peer review landscape because it's heavily populated by certain people and not others. Yeah, great question. I didn't mention it earlier, but I completely agree that peer review is a really interesting case of this. Um, so there are correctly utilized proposals by various uh, government branches that run some kind of grant context, uh, starting with the DRD and DARPA, but not limited to DARPA. 
Um, now there, it's being talked about at the NSX, but it's being talked about at the NEH to a lesser extent. So the proposal is, um, hey, uh, so for DARPA, it was originally, we are so tired of funding this social science research that doesn't replicate each uh, I think that's unfair to social science. I think a lot of natural science does not replicate. But um, we are so tired of funding this. We want some kind of predictive tool that will tell us right now which papers will replicate. And then it went from there to we want some kind of predictive tool that will tell us which grants are worth funding. Now, I think this decision scenario has the problem that you suggested, which is um, in the past, the papers that have been published, that have been high impact, you know, that's the kind of data we're going to use, uh, do exhibit a real skew in a socially biased way. And so if we're training on this past history, we're going to learn a lot of those biases. Yeah. There's a second um, problem that I think is especially relevant in the scientific context, which is if we are training on past scientific papers, we are more likely to let the uh, that good papers are ones that do what we've done in the past. So they're using our old theory terms, they're using uh, well-established paradigms that have been successful for a long time. But in science, we often want to leave it open that someone is going to propose something groundbreaking, something new, something different, something that talks in a really different way, even just in the level of text in the paper, because it's proposing a different methodology or theory. And so if we are stuck in this kind of predictive success from the past, um, we would have to do something really clever to try to find those novel papers and distinguish them from papers that are novel because they're just really bad. Um, I don't think that's impossible, but it's a challenge. A third challenge is that all the different agencies that are going to try to do this are all going to use the same source of data, which is, you know, Web of Science, Scobus, all of our attempts to collect all the papers that exist. Again, there's only one repository of all the papers that exist. So to an extent that existing data sources replicate that, they're going to be making the second um, finders predictions of the same type of mistakes. First, I just want to thank you. That was really a great talk. And I have so many questions. I feel like my head is exploding. Sweet. But the one thing I've been thinking about is when we think about systematic decision making or making them bring out a larger scale, but when you think about making it individually, you're making different mistakes in each different cocktail. So overall, you know, in this thing, it's just, on a larger scale, but the same magnitude of errors. Just, I don't know if I'm making myself Yeah, error. absolutely. But I guess the question then is, so if you're making it on a larger scale, then can you go back in time, not trying to recreate the, the algorithm, but just looking at what our outcomes are. So to, to what extent have we gotten to what we want to do or not? So I, I think back from the, the Amazon example where retroactively they looked and saw that in their algorithms excluding women and, and, and racial minorities because they were looking at us. But you can look at that, right? To say, okay, how did we do? Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So we can try to analyze our algorithms, as you're saying, and we can say, hey, um, Amazon tried to create this resume screening uh, software. It learned from past decisions by Amazon recruiters. Uh, and so it learned to uh, take points away from the score if, for example, uh, the resume included in anything that said women. So like Women's College, Wells, Lady D, um, Women's Liquor and List, whatever. Um, and it had a bunch of other things like that. So luckily, Amazon realized this, as you're also saying, before it was deployed. So they never used it. They just created it, analyzed it, realized it, and a travel. Okay, so we can, we can try to do that. Uh, and in the cases where we have perfect information, uh, we could try to figure out who are the people on whom we're bringing systemic mistakes, and can we figure out any characteristics of these people that will allow us to predict who are the people will be in the future. Um, the hard part would be if we don't have access to how the different decisions line up with each other, 
then it might be hard to figure out what's the pattern. Uh, we might just have these individuals who we ultimately realize are experiencing these issues once they have been excluded from a lot of these opportunities. Um, but I think the other part of your comment is really bad, which is, look, we're still going to have errors. So the question is, do we want the old case where we had um, lots of different errors made by lots of different people that were much more noisy or stochastic, and so they hit different people? Or do we want the new case where, you know, we don't know if this is true, but in the best case, they're fearing that total errors, but they're concentrated on a smaller number of people. I think that's a substantive moral question. I tried to present an argument that the second thing is worse, but I think you could also argue, um, hey, what matters is the total number of errors, not how they're concentrated. And if the algorithm is well, fewer right now total errors, that's what. Good afternoon, and thank you again for this uh, this talk you gave us. First, I have to say that as a person in heaven, I do kind of think this takes out. But I do want to like to know a question that then that was raised was it. Businesses and organizations are going to start looking at perhaps don't buying these different models to come up with a a model that they can actually use that would be desirable. How do we know that these different models will actually be able to speak to each other so that they can be combined? Especially when we start thinking about the perhaps the proprietary nature of all of these different models. Yeah, great question. And uh justice for Kevin's <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. So we, when you have these different models, we're positing this world in which we do have some kind of privileged access to that. We're able to figure out um, what are these different models at these different institutions doing? Uh, what are the bases of their decisions? What are the consistent patterns of their mistakes? Um, as you're saying, it might be that decisions are being made in very different ways. And so it can be hard to uh, directly combine the way the model is making decisions. But, but what we can look at, at least, is the pattern of the outcome. And so we can say, what kind of patterns do we see across the models? And what can we learn from that about mainly systemic errors in all the models? Great. Thanks. DP. So, uh, taking so long as your brain talks, um, so I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of um, engineering by putting together the, the models the bees that we already have. Uh, so I can imagine a computer scientist or some kind of engineer saying, hey, look, we could we can build a better system. And matter of fact, that's, that's what we do as engineers. Um, I guess I want to ask you to comment briefly on Lopez. Does that make sense? So there's such a thing as better and better and your best. Yeah, great question. So um, I I loved I love being a double major. I will thank you for considering double majoring. But this is one of the questions where I can, I can really think about it with both of my trainings. So the computer scientist that means I was intrinsically, if you have all these different models that both that has high predictive success but can slightly different decisions, there is information you're leaving on the table by not combining. You want to take all those models and produce one supermodel that's better and um it's like it would have very slightly better predictive success that each of those models used an silly fan so that is one way to think about it and uh the from case to case it will vary how much better the model is maybe it's only fractionally better maybe it's a fair amount better um but i i think that is just something we have to weigh against the consistency of the output. And so there might be cases, for example, one case that people frequently refer to that I think makes a lot of sense is medical decision making. So there might be cases where we might say, hey, it's so important to us. We're going to use this algorithm across millions of patients. It's so important to us to have fractionally better predictive success because that's going to be better for so many more patients that we do need to combine the models. We need, do need to have um, 
the best version of these models because also people only interact with this medical decision making system once. Mm -hmm. uh, they only interact with it, you know, they only have this issue at this hospital one time. They're not experiencing more keen encounters typically uh, in the same way that you could apply to 80 jobs or you could apply to 30 jobs every five years, for example. That's a lot of repeated encounters with the same system. Whereas in a medical case, hopefully you have some kind of problem, you get your prediction once, and then, you know, ideally you don't have that same problem again. So I think there are cases where we want to say, no, we don't want to randomize, do you want the best possible? Um, and uh, that it's, it's not the, yeah, that is sort of a case by case basis, but dependent on the underlying features of the decision landscape and the decision because of it. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, my mind is also turning. Yeah. Um, if I understand correctly, and I am uh, either a philosopher nor, nor a, a computer scientist, um, the kind of uh, negative outcome that you're focusing on is a case of a kind of repeated exclusion, right? Um, and that is what the Zenobia with modern culture is. But I'm thinking about um, the different possible effects of that kind of moral culture. So, you know, ever since we had AP exams, teachers and history started teaching to the AP exam. And we have Kaplan's and Pittston's preparing students for college admissions and SADs. And so there is a kind of level of, you know, human ingenuity that adjusts to the algorithm, right? And we start um, preparing and self-policing to crack the algorithm. So I'm wondering if there are kind of greater propagation kind of dangers to this kind of monoculture. Yeah, awesome question. So um, I totally agree on both counts. This this is very related to what I'm talking about, and also yeah, separate um, from the phenomenon. So I would say two things. One, um, we if we're thinking about these sort of like broader uh, sources of like cultural homogenization or something like that. Um, we do see that in generative AI. So there was a really interesting paper recently that looked at uh, the extent to which relying on generative AI um, in text composition made the final essays and the final stories uh, much more similar than they would have been otherwise. So there's kind of like a homogenizing effect on their linguistic level. Um, but then, yeah, we could also think about to what extent has the adoption of algorithmic decision-making changed the uh, opportunity landscape. So here I would draw on um, a wonderful legal scholar named Joseph Fishkin, who has this book called Butlins. And one thing that he talks about is, uh, well, let's look at the broader structure of opportunity and the extent to which um, ability to have some kind of good life outcome is fundamental to these narrow bottlenecks where you have to be good at exactly one thing. So one thing that um, these people sometimes criticize standardized testing for, uh, we can get to whether this is fair, is that it creates a bottleneck where in order to access higher education, you have to be good at this particular kind of uh, activity, which is taking the status. Uh, and that's contrasted to something like your grades, where your grades are a much more heterogeneous collection of activities and tests that you were at high able to score. It's not just this one test, it's a large number of actions that you took over time in a wide variety of different disciplines, etc. So the question is, is it better to have something that's more heterogeneous in this way than to have the sort of like single test? And um, there we, we might want to weigh, uh, is the single test or the heterogeneous collection, for example, better on socioeconomic diversity, better on racial diversity. There are lots of different metrics that we could use to compare these things. But we could also say, um, we, we also want to include just the homogeneity or the heterogeneity of this bottleneck that we're asking me to the test there. Um, so what he argues in the book is, if you imagine sort of an extreme case uh, where there's a society where every opportunity 
is predicated on some kind of physical contest. So you have to be really great at throwing the javelin and ancient grace or something like that. Um, and we said, hey, we're, we're to prepare everyone. We're going to give them an equal opportunity to prepare to be straight of throwing the javelin. But then once that contest happens, everything that happens after that is predicated on your ability to do well at this test. Uh, even if the test is fair in some sense, even if you had equal opportunity ways to prepare for it, there's something that's less vivid or less just about a society with that narrow of a bottom line. So one way to evaluate um, different algorithmic landscapes that do or don't include algorithms might be, do they increase or do they decrease the size of the bottleneck that you have to go through to get some kind of opportunity? Oh, it's take A. Now, big, listen fast. Right, can I turn off the down? No. All right, so related to that, do you see AI and, um, I guess, these models being able to open that bottle that in any way? And, like, how so? I guess on the, as we talk about the college emissions. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think the interesting thing about these as um, models is there's no intrinsic reason why they would have to shrink the opportunities landscape. It really depends on how we use them and what uh, what else we combine them with, um, how many pieces of um, different kinds of evaluations we have. And so in in some sense, it, uh, there, there are ways to use Predictive algorithms, et cetera, that should widen the opportunity landscape. Um, and so, if we're able to think about what are the different kinds of information that we're drawing from, what are the different kinds of um, models that we're using to learn from that information, and then how are we combining that with human judgment? So, in this kind of human in a live way, where we have um, a prediction from the algorithm, and then we have uh, a human judgment that goes along with it. But I think there are a lot of really clever proposals coming out of fields like human computer interaction for how to set up those systems in a way that increases the space of information that we're looking at as opposed to decreasing them. And it would be that in uh, the sub college admissions cases, we are already doing that. So we are finding, you know, certain predictive factors that we didn't know to look for before that are generally inspectives and are um, genuinely helping us find candidates who will write the university that we maybe didn't know to look for before. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. We really appreciated the talk.